Today we come to Genesis chapter 29, where the subject is Jacob's marriages and children as he escapes to the east, fleeing from the murderous threats of his brother Esau. So let's pick it up here. Genesis chapter 29, beginning at verse 1, we read. So Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. And he looked and saw a well in the field, and behold, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks. A large stone was on the well's mouth. Now all the flocks would be gathered there, and they would roll the stone from the well's mouth, water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place on the well's mouth. Verse 1 tells us that Jacob eventually came to the land of the people of the east. Now, in the previous chapter, Genesis chapter 28, we see how Jacob had a very real encounter with God, both with a heavenly vision that was of a ladder with the angels of God ascending and descending upon it, uh, showing him that there was a real connection, real access between heaven and earth, and God was going to use that access to speak directly to Jacob and to confirm with him the covenant that God had made to his grandfather Abraham and passed on to his father Isaac, now was being passed on to the grandson Jacob. And God also promised to preserve and to bless Jacob on this journey to the east. Well, because the Lord blessed his journey, his trip, Jacob now came to the land that his mother Rebekah came from. It was also the land of his grandfather, Abraham. And as he comes, he looks, he sees a well in a field. He noticed this well that was used to water the sheep. The well was covered and protected, verse 2 says, by a large stone. Now we pick it up starting at verse 4. And Jacob said to them, My brethren, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haran. Then he said to them, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. So he said to them, Is he well? And they said, He is well. And look, his daughter Rachel is coming with the sheep. Then he said, Look, it is still day. It is not time for the cattle to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go feed them. But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together, and they have rolled the stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. Now, while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass, when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth, and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. So, Jacob makes conversation with the shepherd boys that have been tending the three flocks of sheep that were in some kind of close proximity. They weren't far from the well. He initially asks them, My brethren, verse 4, where are you from? <laughs> now, please remember, what a different age we live in today. Today, we have clearly marked roads and signs in most places. We have elaborate maps. We have our GPS devices, our navigation apps on our phones and all the rest of it. T today, it's usually not too hard to figure out where you're at. But in an age before such clearly marked roads and signs and navigational aids, Jacob didn't know where he was until he asked some of the locals. Then Jacob discovered, I'm at my destination. I'm where Laban, my uncle, lives. This is the place where my mother, Rebecca, sent me to go. I've arrived at my destination. And that's why he had this conversation in verse 5 with the shepherd boys. Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? You see, that's what Jacob knew he needed to do. Contact his uncle Laban. Again, the brother of his mother. And these shepherd boys not only knew Laban, but they also told Jacob that Laban's daughter, this is in verse 6, was approaching. Well, there she is. She's coming with her own flock of sheep. And after hearing that Laban's daughter, Rachel, was approaching, 
Jacob told the shepherd boys to go take care of the sheep. He says to them, go water the sheep and go feed them. And that would give Jacob opportunity to speak more directly to Rachel, to have some time just him and her without the meddlesome shepherd boys around. Well, the boys answered, well, we got to wait a little while. The, the, the men aren't here to roll away the stone from the well's mouth. Jacob so wants to get rid of these shepherd boys, verse 10 says, that he went near the well and rolled the stone from the well's mouth. You see, Jacob knew that he had come to marry one of the daughters of Laban, who actually would be his cousin. But again, th this is something that's evolving in God's uh, economy as things get further and further from Adam. Uh, marriage with relatives becomes more problematic in a genetic sense. Uh, marriage to cousins was not completely unknown in the Bible. But he knew that he had come to marry one of the daughters of Laban. Therefore, Jacob was happy to show kindness and perhaps strength to Laban's daughter, Rachel. So the shepherd boys had waited for someone to remove the stone, and Jacob did it in the presence of Rachel, no doubt impressing her and the shepherd boys with what a strong man he was to move that stone from the mouth of the well. But we have to admit, Jacob had a lot of motivation to do this. Impressing a beautiful woman can give a lot of motivation to a young man. Anyway, now pick it up at verse 11. Then Jacob kissed Rachel. But by the way, let me just say, we shouldn't regard this as a romantic kiss. This was the kiss of a greeting common in those cultures. Uh, it still obviously involves close contact with the individual, just to state the obvious. Uh, but this wasn't a romantic kiss. This was the kiss of a relative greeting. Uh, I'll begin again here at verse 11. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative and that he was Rebekah's son. So she ran and told her father. Then it came to pass when Laban heard the report about Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him up to his house. So he told Laban all these things, and Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for a month. I can only imagine what this whole scene was like for Rachel. Rachel sees a man she had never met before uh, there among the shepherd boys uh, at the well for the watering of the flocks, this man comes, and in sort of a show of strength, this he-man comes and removes the stone from the well so that the flocks can be watered. We have the feeling that normally this was the kind of thing that was done by several men, but Jacob did it himself. And then that man greets her, kisses her, and then starts weeping out loud. Uh, you could forgive Rachel for at least a few moments wondering, what's going on here? Who is this man? And, and why did he just greet me in this way and then start crying? But then it says there in verse 12, Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative. Now, surely Rachel had been told about her aunt Rebecca. And aunt Rebecca in Laban's household, in the home Rachel grew up, must have been quite a figure. Aunt Rebecca met another man at a well, this messenger from Abraham, Jacob's grandfather. And after introductions and getting to know Aunt Rebecca, after watering the uh, messenger's flocks, uh, flocks, uh, camels, actually, after watering the messenger's camels, ended up going away to marry this wealthy and distant relative to their family. I imagine there was a fair amount of talk about Aunt Rebecca and that remarkable thing that happened to her. Well, here is the son of Aunt Rebecca. And again, she must have been astounded to put the connections together in front of her. The bottom line is, verse 14 says that Jacob stayed with Laban 
for a month. Now, Laban, of course, is showing generous hospitality, and part of that is because of the custom in those ancient cultures and in modern Eastern cultures as well. But not only because Jacob was his nephew, <laughs> Laban also knew that Jacob would inherit a significant fortune from his father Isaac. Jacob is the son of the very wealthy man that Aunt Rebecca went off to marry. And Laban has, to use a modern expression, dollar signs in his eyes. He's, he's anticipating the riches that this man Jacob represents in terms of his inheritance. So now in verse 15, Laban is going to begin speaking about an agreement with Jacob. Uh, here we go, verse 15. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now, Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. Laban let Jacob know that if he wanted to remain among them, he had to stay on as a hired servant. That's the sense of the phrase in verse 15 when Laban said to Jacob, what should your wages be? You see, Jacob was the son of a man with tremendous wealth, and I am suspecting, and forgive me a little bit of conjecture here, this is conjecture, so you can take this for what it's worth. I believe that Jacob was probably not accustomed to hard work. I'm not trying to say he was lazy. But in the household where Jacob grew up under his father Isaac and his mother Rebekah, they had tremendous wealth. I would be inclined to believe that servants did the hard work in the home that Jacob grew up in. Now Jacob was the servant. And Laban kind of reminds him of this arrangement. What should your wages be? You stayed with me for a month. Now you're going to have to get to work. And I think that in this situation where a man who had been served, and I'm going to agree with you, this is a little bit of conjecture on my heart, uh, on my mind, I should say. I'm just uh, taking it from the knowledge that Isaac was a man of tremendous resources inherited from his father, Abraham. And among those resources would be a lot of servants. And with a lot of servants around, you don't do so much menial labor if you're a son in the family. But again, now the shoe's on the other foot. Th this man who had been largely served, and again, I'm, I'm not criticizing Jacob. I'm not saying that he was a lazy man, not at all. Uh, I'm sure he worked hard in his own way, but it didn't involve a lot of manual labor. But a man who previously had been served, now is the one who must serve. And let me tell you, Jacob's reaction in this situation would reveal much of his character. There's a principle. Uh, I'm not going to say it's a law or a rule, of course, but it's a principle. And I think there's some truth to it. That a person never knows what kind of servant they are until other people treat them like a servant. <laughs> That's when you really know what kind of servant you are. Well, Jacob's going to be treated like a servant, and he willingly put himself under the servitude of Laban for seven years to win the daughter, Rachel. Why? Because verse 18 says, Jacob loved Rachel. Now, part of this was Rachel's attractiveness. Verse 17 plainly tells us, and this is given for some reason, that Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. 
Uh, apparently, both in her figure and in her face, other aspects of her appearance, she was a beautiful woman. But not only that, let's remember that Rachel was the first friendly face that Jacob had seen in the area. It's understandable that there could have been a very real love at first sight, to use a phrase, attachment that Jacob had to Rachel. Now, in contrast, Rachel's older sister, Leah, it says of her in verse 17 that Leah's eyes were delicate. What does that mean? Well, as I've read the Bible commentators, there's some dispute as to what exactly that phrase means. Some people think that it means that her eyes were bad and she couldn't see well. Maybe she was the kind of person who had to squint all the time because she couldn't see well. Other people think that it means that her eyes were kind of dull, uh, not beautiful. Her eyes were not full of life like her sister Rachel's eyes. But this uh, comparison is kind of telling, isn't it? Lee is the older but uh, she's not as pretty as her sister, Rachel. And the comparison of Rachel and Leah and their respect to beauty, I would regard that as at least a small clue into what was probably a complicated, conflict-filled and competitive life among the daughters in Laban's family. In any regard, in verse 18, Jacob makes the offer to his uncle Laban, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. This offer to work for seven years was essentially a dowry. Though Jacob came from a family with great wealth, he left home with little money. And before he could take a woman in marriage, he had to provide a dowry to her family to demonstrate that he was fit to support a family and to compensate the family for the taking of the daughter who would have been a valued worker in the home. And from what we can understand, it's always a little bit hard to get these ancient equivalents, but from what we can understand, Seven years, as mentioned in verse 18, was a very generous offer, far above a normal dowry. If you take the, the wages of a hired man for seven years, add it all together, and, and present that as a dowry, you're talking about a substantial amount. It's very possible that Jacob made this very generous offer. He didn't say, I'll work for her one year or two years or five years. He said seven years. And it's possible that Jacob made this very generous offer because he didn't want to risk being refused. And when Uncle Laban saw how greatly Jacob desired Rachel, well, he knew he could take advantage of his nephew which he is going to do. By the way, though, you got to appreciate the way that Laban plays the game. Did you see what Laban said? He said, well, it's better to give her to you than I should give her to some other man. Laban's playing it very cool. Well, you, you want to uh, uh, marry my daughter, Rachel. You offer to work seven years. Well, okay, maybe. Why not? It's better than giving her to somebody else. When actually, I would suggest that Laban was hoping, dreaming, in, on the inside of himself, he was begging that Jacob would make such an offer because he desperately wanted to get his daughter married into this wealthy and influential family. But Jacob offered a very generous offer. Laban agreed, and Jacob would have to work and wait seven years before he married his cousin Rachel. Now, I wonder how many men today would agree to such a thing. You want to marry my daughter? Fine. Work for me for seven years, and I'm not going to pay you. I'll give you room and board. I'll provide you a place to live and feed you. But I'm not going to pay you. Your pay is that I'm going to allow you to marry my daughter. Friends, in the modern world, it's hard to think of a single, of, a, of an individual man uh, who would do, who would agree to such an agreement. But Jacob not only agreed to it in verse 20, 
It says, and I'm going to read this again because it's so beautiful. The seven years seemed only a few days to him because of the love that he had for her. Now, Jacob, no doubt, was attracted to Rachel because she was beautiful in form and appearance, in her figure and in her face, if we want to use that terminology. But it was much more than a superficial attraction to her beauty. Friends, that would have worn off. Uh, That would have worn off at least in a few years. But he loved her as a person. He loved her uh, in her character. And because of the great love that he had for Rachel, the seven years of labor without pay, again, except for room and board, it seemed to pass as quickly as a few days. And please remember, in that ancient culture, Jacob was not allowed to spend as much time as he wanted with Rachel. There would be very strict social guidelines to separate the unmarried men and women. I'm not saying, of course, that he could never see her, but they, they, they wouldn't be able to go on long walks together, take trips together and all this. No, no, no. The, the, these things were very much within the uh, the regulations of ancient conduct. And I think that this action of Jacob, not only what he did in being willing to serve and to wait the seven years, it displays something of a very powerful heart. This demonstrates an important principle that true love is willing to wait for another person. Jacob was willing to wait, and may I add, wait and work seven years for Rachel. Now, many years ago, almost 30 years ago in the United States, there was a campaign among mainly church-going teens titled True Love Waits. It persuaded them to take the following pledge. This is what they would say. This is what they would pledge to God. Believing that true love waits, I make a commitment to God, myself, my family, those I date, my future mate, and my future children to be sexually pure until the day I enter a covenant marriage relationship. Now, I think it's valid to debate how successful that campaign was, uh, the validity of making such pledges before God, uh, the unintended consequences of such things, but, but I think it's touching on a true principle, at least, that true love will wait. That Jacob was willing to wait for Rachel because of the love that he had for her. So, at least in the text of Genesis chapter 29, the years pass very quickly, do they not? The years pass quickly, and now, verse 21, we're already at the wedding night. Verse 21. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go in to her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. Now it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob. And he went in to her. He had sexual relations with her, as would be appropriate for a husband and wife. And Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid. So it came to pass in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? Friends, these uh, five verses describe one of the most surprising scenes in the Old Testament. It's the wedding day. Or excuse me, the seven years are fulfilled. Let's begin there. The seven years are fulfilled. And Jacob says, listen, I've been willing to wait for seven years, but I've been marking my calendar every day. These seven years are up and I'm done waiting. Where's my wife? And Jacob says, fine, let's have a wedding. But the wedding that Laban had in mind was not a wedding with Jacob and Rachel, but a wedding with Jacob and Leah. 
And Laban, being the deceiver, the con man, the rascal that he was, he deceived Jacob. And he said, I'm going to switch things on you. So again, even though the time went quickly because of his love, when that time was fulfilled, Jacob wanted to take Rachel as his wife. So Laban makes for a wedding. Verse 22 says that he gathered all the men of the place and made a feast. And we could just imagine how ornate the whole situation was. This is a big wedding. But verse 23 says that Laban took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob. And he went into her. Now, it was possible for Jacob to be fooled because of the wedding customs of the day. According to those customs, the wife was veiled until she was finally alone with her husband in the honeymoon suite. If it was dark by the time Jacob and his new bride were alone together, which wouldn't have been difficult to arrange. I mean, look, they've got a big feast going on. Well, this helps explain how Jacob was fooled, especially if Jacob would have had a fair amount to drink at the wedding celebration. The bottom line was Laban's deception worked. And from Laban's perspective, it worked brilliantly. He arranged for Jacob to marry Leah, to sleep with Leah, and to establish, because of both the marriage ceremony and the consummation of the marriage, that Leah was actually his wife. Now, we would assume, and this is only assumption, it can be debated, of course, but we would assume that Leah agreed with this. We think of poor Leah. She knows that her sister Rachel is far favored. She wonders, especially being the older sister, will I ever marry? And maybe she agreed to this because she thought, well, how else am I ever going to be married? But I'll tell you, even if Leah did not agree with this, she was still under the authority of her father. Um, I like what uh, Leopold, the commentator, says of this. He says this, quote, she may have loved Jacob secretly. She may have considered this her one chance to get a husband. She may have thought this an unsought and therefore justifiable opportunity to steal a march on her sister. Well, those are suggestions and perhaps plausible suggestions, but I'll add one more thing to it. Remember that in such cultures as uh, this, the father has great authority in the home. And some people would say absolute authority. I don't know if the word absolute is appropriate, but certainly the father had great authority in the home. And this may explain why the father Laban could say to Leah, you're going through to this and could say to Rachel, you're going to allow this to happen because of the recognized great authority of a father in the family. The bottom line is revealed there in verse 25. So it came to pass in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. You know, if you think of this situation actually happening, because it did actually happen, you can imagine how Jacob felt. <laughs> My goodness, this isn't Rachel at all. Uh, for seven years, I've been dreaming of being intimate with Rachel, this woman I love, and under the cloak of uh, darkness and maybe even a bit of drunkenness, I found out now that I wasn't intimate with Rachel. I was intimate with her sister, Leah. What's happened here? You can imagine how Jacob felt. You can imagine how Leah felt. Leah, in the morning, is perhaps expecting to see a loving response in the eyes of Jacob. Uh, maybe she's hoping, wondering if, if Jacob always had some attraction, maybe not the same attraction for the sister, but at least some attraction to Leah. And she's wondering, are you going to accept me or are you going to uh, reject her? And then, of course, we wonder how poor Rachel felt. <laughs> I, 
I wonder if they didn't have Rachel tied up in another tent because she just wouldn't tolerate this unless she was subdued in some way. You can imagine how Jacob felt, how Leah felt, how Rachel felt, but all of this drama, all of this crisis was because of Laban's sin. Or, let me pan the camera back a little bit more, get a little bigger picture in view. Perhaps you could say that it was because of Jacob's sin. Because now the deceiver was deceived. When Jacob stormed into Laban's tent and demanded, why then have you deceived me? We understand that significantly, Laban's deception toward Jacob was like the deception that Jacob used with his father Isaac and his brother Esau. You could say that this was an example of Jacob reaping what we had sown. Just a couple chapters previous, we see how Jacob wanted to substitute himself for his brother Esau. And so now Laban is substituting the older sister Leah for the younger sister Rachel. Jacob exchanged the younger for the older. Laban exchanged the older for the younger. But it was still a sibling exchange. Now notice this. When Jacob deceived his father and cheated his brother, God did not change his plan to choose Jacob to receive the birthright and to carry on Abraham's covenant. No, instead, God took Jacob to school. You could call it the school of difficult experience in, in a, a modern expression or an old expression in the English languages. He took him to the school of hard knocks to discipline him. And this gives us the pattern that a believer's disobedience may not derail God's plan for their life, but it will greatly affect on how that disobedient believer ends up experiencing it. Someone might end up in the same place as uh, Jacob did. He ended up spending 20 years working for someone like Laban. Well, God taught him a few things. Now, I think it's entirely justifiable to see this as God's correction upon Jacob. This is poetic justice. <laughs> Jacob, you deceived your father with a sibling exchange. Your uncle's going to deceive you with a sibling exchange. However, this in no way justifies Laban's deception. Friends, the fact that God does work all things together with good never excuses the evil things that men or women may do. Well, Jacob has stormed into Laban's tent, demanded, what's going on here? I thought I married Rachel last night, and I found out that I married and consummated the marriage with her older sister Leah, the one I didn't want. What's going on here? You can just imagine how angry Jacob must have been. Here's Laban's response starting at verse 26. And Laban said, It must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week, and we will give you this one also for the service which you will serve me still another seven years. Then Jacob did so and fulfilled her week, Leah's week, so he gave him his daughter Rachel as wife also, and Laban gave his maid Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as a maid. Then Jacob also went in to Rachel, and he also loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served with Laban still another seven years. <laughs> Jacob storms into the tent. What's going on here? How come I woke up with Leah and not with Rachel? And Laban's response is, it must not be done so in our country. This excuse by Laban basically said, well, didn't I tell you? We don't do it this way around here. I thought you knew. 
And the only reason Jacob accepted this clever deception from Laban was really he had no other option. But Laban's supposed reason was really nothing more than an excuse. He says in verse 27, serve with me. This is what Laban said to Jacob. Serve with me still another seven years. Can you imagine? Jacob makes an overly generous offer for a dowry. Hey, Laban, I'll work for you seven years without pay so that I can marry your daughter, Rachel. Laban says, okay. And now that over generous offer of seven years has now just been doubled to 14 years. And that second seven years could be considered what I would call Jacob's postgraduate work in the school of difficult experience, or to use that phrase, the school of hard knocks. And Jacob's main subject, his major in that school of difficult experience was, you reap what you sow. That's surely one great thing that God was saying to Jacob through this, and maybe that made Jacob a little bit more willing to accept this. Something in his conscience said, I deserve this. But at the end of it, verse 30 says, he served with Laban still another seven years. You could say that Laban was a perfect picture of a deceptive manipulator. Laban ended up getting exactly what he wanted. He wanted both his daughters married and he wanted 14 years of free labor from Jacob. Yet this would, in the end, turn out badly for him and for his daughters. Sometimes God will judge manipulators by giving them what they want in their sinful desires and methods, yet allowing it to be a loss for them. And that's what it would be ultimately for Laban. Now, in general, the problems in this family can be seen immediately, really. Not only had Jacob married two sisters, but he also allowed them and everyone else to know that one was favored and loved far more than the other. Jacob had two wives, and one of them he kind of openly despised. The other one he loved dearly. Ultimately, all of these problems came from Laban's manipulative deception. And you could say, in the big picture of God's unfolding plan, uh, the problems came from the prior sin of Jacob that brought it all on upon himself in the you reap what you have sown principle. Now, can we speculate just for a moment here? What should Jacob have done. I mean, did Jacob handle this situation the best way? And of course, we're just experimenting in our thinking here. We, we, we really don't have any biblical alternative, so to speak, but I'm going to suggest something that I think is based on biblical principles. Now, some people say that Jacob should have gone to Laban and told him to correct the whole mess. And he would divorce Leah let Leah be Laban's problem and say, no, I'm married to Rachel. So, some people suggest that, and maybe that could have been a course of action. Now, other people believe that according to the standards of that culture, he could not have put Leah aside because he was unable to, or she was unable to marry another man after having begun to Jacob. In those societies, I have to say, kind of sadly, unlike our own, virginity was prized, it was valued, and it really meant something in the marriage prospects of a woman if she was no longer a virgin. So some people say he should have just given Leah back to Laban, but there would have been significant problems uh, if, in a sense, making Leah even more of a victim. Perhaps what Jacob should have done was simply to love his two wives equally. But friends, what a mess this was. Now Jacob has two wives. 
Now, polygamy is not widely practiced in Western culture today. In some non-Western cultures in the world today, polygamy is still practiced. But in Western cultures, we often practice what you might call serial marriage. You know, serial refers to something that happens in a series. And when it comes to this kind of terminology, uh, polygamy is kind of like mass marriage. Look, I, I know it's not a great analogy, so for, forgive me for using linking these two things, but it's just I'm just using common ways of speaking. People speak about mass murder today. Uh, someone who kills a lot of people at once. And, and just in terms of the word mass, please, I'm not, I'm not making an analogy between marriage and murder here, but it's in the way that the word mass is used. Polygamy is like mass marriage. It, it's, it's, it's marrying a bunch of people at once. But, but there are other murderers in the world today that are sometimes called serial murderers. And that's where a murderer kills many, but one at a time in a series. What I'm just trying to say, in modern Western culture, wives are often multiplied, but typically one at a time. In modern Western culture, we would look at a man, if your next door neighbor had three wives at one time, you'd say, my, this is shocking. What's happening? There's a polygamous family next door. But if that neighbor next door had three wives in sequence, a first wife, a second wife, a third wife, with a divorce in between, people don't think anything at all of it today. I'm just trying to say, in the West, we practice uh, multiple marriage, but we just do it in series. Now, God's blessing is not upon fundamentally polygamy. Uh, we'll talk about that more at a later time. Polygamy was permitted under the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant. It, it was never God's plan from the beginning. W when Jesus spoke about marriage, he spoke about God bringing together a man and a woman in a covenant relationship before God. And he looked back to the Garden of Eden and said that that was God's intention from the beginning. <laughs> And one fascinating thing about the Bible is though the Bible shows us many polygamous households, they're all messed up. They all have problems. You just wait and see what it's like in this household of Jacob and Rachel and Leah and see what a mess it is, how their family life is a disaster. No, you, you never see uh, a blessed, harmonious polygamous family in the Bible. Now, friends, a believer today, where we don't practice so much polygamy, but serial marriage, a believer can't do anything about marriages that have broken up in the past. But they can do all they can before God to make sure that from now on, it'll be one partner for all time. That they'll marry in the Lord, number one, They'll marry so as to be equally yoked, someone who has the same passion and commitment unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And they will live out their married life under biblical principles. Those kind of things will help ensure, I, I won't say guarantee, but help ensure that that's a marriage that's never broken up and lasts as God intends for all of life. Okay, now we come to the last section of Genesis chapter 29. Here we come to Jacob's first four sons that were born through Leah. Here we go, uh, verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. You know, we left off at verse 30 with that section that speaks about Jacob very plainly loving Rachel, but not Leah. And what a burden, what a pain that must have been for Leah. But the Lord saw, verse 31 says, that Leah was unloved. God's compassion on Leah is touching. She was truly the innocent party in all of this mess. God can bring comfort and blessing to a wife, and he can meet her needs even when the husband acts in an ungodly manner. 
I like what uh, Martin Luther said about this. This is cited in James Montgomery Boyce's excellent commentary on Genesis. So here's Boyce quoting Luther. He says this, Wretched Leah sits sadly in her tent with her maid and spends her time spinning and weeping. For the rest of the household, and especially Rachel, despises her because she has been scorned by her husband who prefers Rachel and is desperately in love with Rachel alone. She's not beautiful, not pleasing. No, she's odious and hated. There the poor girl sits. No one pays any attention to her. Rachel gives herself airs before. She does not deign to look at her. I am the lady of the house, Rachel thinks. Leah is a slave. These are truly carnal things in the saintly fathers and mothers, like the things that usually happen in our houses. That's a very expressive picture Martin Luther painted here of Leah's situation, of her unloved status. But notice Luther's making the connection that there were messed up homes in the Bible. There's messed up homes among God's people today. And the answer is always the same. It's to turn to God's direction for what he says a family should be. And anyway, getting back to verse 31, we read that when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb. God was good to Leah, even when her husband wasn't good to her, and even when her sister wasn't good to her. Much later on, the prophet Isaiah will write, and this is Isaiah chapter 54, verse 5, For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. That passage in Isaiah establishes the principle that God can act in some sense as a husband to his people. Now, literal human husbands are responsible to care for their wives, yet when they fail in this, and they do not, God can comfort a hurting wife. God can meet the needs of a hurting wife needs that may be neglected by the husband. So God saw the unloved and tragic state of Leah. What was God's response? Verse 32. So Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, The Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. The firstborn child to Jacob through Leah was named Reuben by Leah, and that means behold a son. This was her statement to Jacob and to everyone else that the Lord had looked upon her affliction. Hey, uh, Rachel, you're not the only favored one in this home, and maybe Jacob favors you, but look, God favors me. Now let's consider this. Reuben, the son of Leah, was the firstborn son of Jacob. And he was the logical one to inherit the promise that God had made to Abraham. And that promise was passed on to Isaac and then to Jacob. Uh, logically, we could say that it would go Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Reuben. Because God had passed it before to not both the sons of Abraham, but to one of them. Not to both the sons of Isaac, but to one of them. So, logically, Reuben's in this preeminent place. But notice, beyond the logic, the heart here in verse 32. Leah's plea, now therefore my husband will love me. I want you to think about something here. Leah was unloved, and she knew that she was unloved. And if I can speak very directly here. Jacob, even though he did not love Leah, was still willing to have sexual intimacy with her. This demonstrates a principle that's still true, that a man will often be willing to have sex completely apart from love. 
women should never forget this. And men, when they consider this about themselves, they should not compliment themselves on this. This is not a good thing in fallen male nature. And only a foolish woman regards a man's willingness to have sex as proof of love. Ladies, if there's a man who, who wants to have sexual intimacy with you, wh whatever form that sexual intimacy might take, if there's a man who wants to have sexual intimacy with you, do not regard that as proof of his love. His love is better proved in sacrificial service. His love is better proved in waiting. Leah was not the first nor the last woman to live under this problem of fallen male nature. Anyway, now on to verse 33. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am unloved. He has therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. The second child born to Jacob through Leah was named by Leah Simeon, meaning hearing. Leah hoped everyone would notice that the Lord had heard her. Again, we, we have this thing. My husband won't listen to me. He doesn't love me, but the Lord will listen to me. The Lord loves me. That's what she means by the phrase there in verse 33. Because the Lord has heard that I am unloved. Apparently, the birth of Reuben did not do what Leah hoped it would do. She had hoped that it would turn the heart of Jacob towards her. But it didn't do that. Leah was still aware of the fact that her husband Jacob did not love her. Again, though he was still willing to have sex with her. Now, I, I do want to point out, Jacob and Leah were married so that there was nothing overtly sinful in a sexual relationship between them. But it plainly shows that Jacob, like many men in their sinful nature, that he was willing and able to have sex with someone that he did not love. I remember reading many years ago in the 90s about a survey that asked the question, have you ever had sex with a woman? They asked men this question. Have you ever had sex with a woman you have actively disliked? In other words, you've had sex with a woman that you didn't like her at all. Or in large measure, you didn't like her. And in that particular survey, 58% of men answered yes. So women, again, I'm just saying, please don't regard a man's sexual interest in you as evidence of his love. Not at all. He needs to prove that love in other ways, honorable ways, godly ways. Now, verse 34, she conceived again and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will become attached to me because I've borne him three sons. Therefore, his name was called Levi. The third child born to Jacob, again through Leah, was named Levi, and that name means attachment. Leah still lived in the hope her husband Jacob would love her and become attached to her through the birth of these sons. And you see that in the phrase in verse 34, now this time my husband will become attached to me. The, the pain in the heart of Leah was just as evident as the hardness of Jacob's heart and as evident as his continued bad attitude towards his wife, Leah. Now, verse 35, we come to the birth of the fourth son. We read this. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, Now I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah. Then she stopped bearing. The fourth son born to Jacob, again through Leah, was named Judah, meaning praise. I find this wonderful. The first three sons, uh, Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, were all named in some way connecting the pain of of Leah in regard to her marriage. 
They reflected the pain and the longing of her heart. But now the fourth son isn't named the, in, in regard to her pain. Now she focuses on God and she could praise him. She names her fourth son, her fourth child, Judah, saying in verse 35, now I will praise the Lord. To some extent, and at least for some period, Leah allowed the Lord to meet her need. And she could now praise God, even though she was in the terrible situation of being in this household where her, her sister despised her, her husband didn't love or appreciate her, seemed that all were against her, but she could still now praise God through this. And I don't want to make light of these grievous trials that Leah suffered. She certainly did. But through them, she knew the Lord better. She was driven to the Lord by the neglect of her husband. Though Leah was neglected by Jacob and despised by Rachel, Leah had a great purpose in God's plan. The two greatest tribes came from Leah, not from Rachel. You, you could say, now again, you could debate which were the greatest tribes of Israel, and there's some arguments to be made here, but you could make a case that two of the greatest tribes were Levi, the priestly tribe, and Judah, the royal tribe. Th those were the two greatest tribes, and they both came from Leah the third and the fourth born sons of Leah. Most importantly, the Messiah came from Leah. The less attractive sister who was neglected and despised, but who learned to look to the Lord and to praise him. Friends, Rachel, the favored one, she was not in the lineage of the Messiah, but Leah, the despised one, was. God selected this precious sister and said, I'm, I'm going to put you up on a pedestal for all generations to look at and to admire the work of the Lord. Beautiful story. And it's going to continue on. We'll see as we make our way next time into Genesis chapter 30. But before we do, let's consider some ways that Genesis chapter 29 points to Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to suggest a few ways, but look, you are attentive viewers and listeners. If you think of more ways, uh, other than the ways I'm about to suggest that Genesis chapter 29 points to Jesus Christ, we'd love to hear them. You, you can respond to us in whatever way is easy or convenient for you. We'd love to hear your additional thoughts on how Genesis chapter 29 points to Jesus Christ. But I'm going to open with these four suggestions. Here's number one. The way that Jacob came from another place to seek a bride was an anticipation of what Jesus did in coming to earth to seek a bride, the church. This is called the bride of Christ. Now, we talked about that last week with Genesis chapter 28, but the same thing holds true here in Genesis chapter 29. Jacob came from another place to seek a bride. So did Jesus. Number two. The way that Jacob met a woman at a well was an anticipation of how Jesus Christ met the Samaritan woman at a well. Friends, if you want some additional reading for today's uh, time in Genesis chapter 29, read John 4, where Jesus met a woman at a well. And uh, he also had this amazing interaction with this woman. And Jacob's meeting of a woman at a well anticipates this. Now, number three, the way that Jacob purchased a bride was an anticipation of how Jesus Christ purchased his bride. Uh, Jesus purchased his bride with something more than 14 years. Jesus purchased his bride with his whole life laid down in sacrifice. <laughs> you could say that Jesus purchased his bride with 33 years plus eternity and especially his sacrificial offering at the cross and in the resurrection. No, the whole life of Jesus was laid down in sacrifice to purchase his bride, and Jacob's spending 14 years to purchase a bride is an anticipation of that. That's 
numbers one, two, and three, uh, coming from another place, meeting a woman at a well, uh, purchasing a bride, and then number four, obviously, the ancestral line of Jesus was furthered through the son Judah, which may I point out was the fourth born, not the firstborn, not Reuben, not Simeon, not Levi, but Judah, born of the rejected and despised wife, Leah. But he was born the son with the name of praise. That's what Judah means. And of course, Jesus Christ is to the ultimate praise of his God and Father in his own glory. Let's give recognition of that as we close in prayer. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Father, that through this very messed up and conflict-filled family, you are still advancing your work and purpose. And Lord, this gives us hope for our troubled families. Lord, would you help every troubled family represented in those viewing or listening to this? Would you help them, Lord God, to take your word, to hold on to it tightly, to submit themselves to it, and to see the blessing of God that comes upon doing things in a way that gives you honor and glory. We look to you for this, God, and we look to you to comfort all those who feel despised and rejected, even in their own home, even as Leah was. Lord, would you reach out with that comfort and grace? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.